For our next section, we are now discussing the binomial probability distribution. Uh, so a binomial experiment is an experiment that satisfies the following requirements. The experiment consists of n Bernoulli trials that end in either success, which we will denote S, or failure, with which we will denote F. The trials are independent, and for each trial, the probability of S is 1 minus the probability of failure, which is some number P between 0 and 1. In the case of P being 0 or 1, this random variable is degenerate, or the resulting random variable, I guess I haven't mentioned a random variable yet, but that random variable would be degenerate because you'd either always get success or always get failure. So we don't consider that situation. Uh, so we can think of the outcome of an experience as a, as a sequence of S and F, such as SS, FSF, which in that case, the, uh, the duration of the experiment would be uh, n equals 5. So the binomial random variable is the associated random variable with binomial experiments, and what a binomial random variable does is it will count the number of successes in the experiment. So x of omega is equal to the number of s in omega. Uh, we should probably not be... Uh, um, I mean, it, why did I write that as a set? That doesn't make any sense. It's not a set, right? It's just a number. Uh, we will then say that X follows a binomial distribution with parameters N and P. Uh, so for example, given that sequence of S's and F's that we saw before, the binomial random variable would evaluate to three. So we denote the probability mass function of X with lowercase b, although that's more notation for this class. I don't really see notations that we use in this class elsewhere because people know what they're talking about when you're reading papers and stuff. So they don't bother to come up with some special notation for it. Anyway, here we have the uh, probability mass function for binomial random variables. This is zero for x that's not an integer from zero to n. And for x between 0 and n, it can, in fact, be computed that the probability mass function for a binomial random variable with parameters n and p is equal to n choose x, p to the power x, times 1 minus p to the power n minus x. So here's some further explanation of this formula. In this situation, there are X successes out of N trials, okay? The probability of each of those successes is P. They are independent trials, so you multiply P X times, and you would multiply one minus P N minus X times. This is accounting for the probability of each of those failures that occurred. And here's the thing, that will get you the probability of, let's say, the sequence SSFSF. That would get you the probability of getting that particular sequence. But the thing is, there's a number of sequences where you could have three successes and two failures. For example, we could have SSSFF, or the other way around, like FF, SSS, and so on. So we need to pick the positions in which successes occur and failures occur. Or we'll just simply pick the position of successes. And if we pick the position of successes, we then know where all the failures occurred in the sample or in this uh, string. So we end up with n choose x, meaning out of x position, out of n positions, choose the x positions where successes occur. The CDF of this random variable X is given next. The probability, no, I don't want black, uh, blue. The probability that X is less than or equal to little x 
is equal to the CDF of the binomial random variable, which is equal to the sum from i equals zero, because you could potentially have zero successes in your sample. So from i equals zero to x rounded down, the probability mass function at i and p, which is equal to the sum from i equals zero to x rounded down, um, and choose i, uh, p to the power i, one minus p to the power n minus i. And it looks like all I did was write down sum over the probability mass function, and that, that is what I'm writing down. I didn't simplify this any further. There's not really a whole lot more that you can say with this formula. Like there's no fun little algebraic simplifications that you get. All you're just gonna say is sum up over the probability mass function. And for that reason, you're, uh, with the exception of um, uh, cases like some strange n or p, uh, historically in this class, I would have students use the tables that were provided in the back of the textbook to work with the probability mass function. Or no, not the probability mass function, the cumulative distribution function. Now, seeing as I am teaching this class online at the moment, I don't necessarily see why I shouldn't, like I'm telling my students that they can use R for pretty much anything, even on quizzes and even on tests. So for that reason, I'm just not going to bother with working with the textbook and using the tables in the back of the book in these videos. Instead, I'm just going to use R to get the CDF for binomial random variables. Although there may be some situations where like we might have um, the input X, we might replace the input X with say one. Okay, if it's one, you don't necessarily have to use R. Maybe I'll tell you not to look up the number and not to use R and ask you to compute the CDF just because there's only two things you're gonna end up having to compute. Only two things are gonna get plugged in, so. But that's kind of where we're, what we're working with right now. I might recycle these videos in the future, and if I do, be aware. All right, so uh, one thing that's nice out in these uh, upcoming sections is I'm not gonna go through the trouble of computing expected values using that summation formula, using like x times p of x, the sum over all x where p of x is not zero. I'm not gonna bother with that anymore. I'm just going to tell you what the expected value for this random variable is. It's NP. Uh, no, it's just NP. It's NP. I was uh, jumping ahead of my head to the variance. The variance of this random variable X is equal to N times P times one minus P. And the standard deviation of X is just the square root of the variance. I'm going to draw your attention to something. One way you can view binomial random variables is as the sum of Bernoulli random variables. In fact, you could probably play around, oops, I didn't want to erase. Have a look at this probability mass function formula and show for me that if you choose an n equal to one, the resulting probability mass function is the, is the probability mass function of the Bernoulli random variable. That is in fact the case. Um, so uh, I, so that's, that's something to look into. Uh, but, okay, I'm saying that binomial random variables are the sum of n Bernoulli random variables, the expected value of a, uh, uh, hold on, n independent Bernoulli random variables. That's critical. If that's the case, 
remember that the expected value of a Bernoulli random variable was p, and the expected value of a binomial random variable is n times p. Hmm. So you're saying, in a sense, that we add up p n times to get the expected value? Hmm. Intriguing. And actually, remember that the variance of a Bernoulli random variable was p times 1 minus p. Well, now we're adding up n of those, and we get n p 1 minus p for the variance? Hmm. Intriguing. So that is something to notice. And also these uh, expected value, well, I don't know necessarily about the variance being something very easily interpreted, but the expected value certainly is. It's saying that if there's a probability of a success happening, let's say that it's a, uh, let's say that the probability of success is uh, 0.1, and you do this experiment 10 times, then you expect to see one success in your sample. Or if you do this experiment 100 times, you expect to see 10 successes in your, in your sample. So it's actually a rather uh, easily interpreted quantity, this uh, n times p quantity. Okay, and uh, I mentioned here that select values of b, x, and p are given in table 8.1 of the textbook, but in this video, I'm just going to use r. Okay, uh, moving on. You flip a fair coin 10 times. All right, so... We should start filling out with numbers. You flip a fair coin 10 times, there's going to be a binomial random variable showing up. So fair coin suggests that the p parameter of this binomial random variable is going to be one half. Presumably what we're doing is counting the number of heads. And if we're counting the number of heads, then the resulting va random variable is binomial. And the n parameter of that binomial random variable will be 10. All right, what is the probability you see exactly four heads? do so without using a table. Uh, the probability that this random variable x, which is following a binomial, binomial distribution with parameters n is 10 and p is 1 half. So the probability that x is equal to 4 is going to be 10 choose 4. Uh, one half to the power four and one half to the power 10 minus four. Okay, you're probably noticing, well, okay, we got one half to the power four, one half to the power 10 minus four. So that's the same as 10 choose four, uh, one half to the power 10. And that's just basically because one half is equal to one minus one half. So maybe I should write one minus one half to be a little bit more clear. Uh, like that, that, that's the reason why, but if you had instead, instead of one half, we said the probability of getting heads is 0.1, then this would be the, then thinking about the probability mass function this way would have been more correct or would have been correct. It's not more correct because the other one is incorrect. All right. So, uh, actually we're going to compute this thing by hand. So we're going to say that 10 choose 4 is 10 factorial divided by 4 factorial times 6 factorial. And we have 1 over 2 to the power 10. That's 1 half raised to the power 10, which is equal to uh, 10 factorial divided by 4 factorial times 6 factorial. We've got 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 over 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And then this is all multiplied by 1 half to the power 10. And the 4 and the 2 will cancel out with the 8. And the 3 will cancel out with the 9, uh, leaving us with 3. So that gets us uh, 210 over... 1024, that's the 10th power of 2, uh, which is equal to, since there is a 2 in common, uh, 105 over 512, which is approximately equal to 0. 0.2. Okay, so that's the answer to that one. 
If x follows a binomial distribution with parameters 10 and 0.5, compute the probability that 4 is less than x, which is less than or equal to 6. So we've actually got a couple ways we could do this. Uh, let's do this without the table. Uh, the probability that 4 is less than x, which is less than or equal to 6, is equal to the probability mass function at 5, because you don't include 4, plus the probability mass function at 6. Which is equal to, uh, uh, it's going to be 10 choose 5, and we know we're just going to end up with 1 half to the power 10 in the end. But if, in general, if uh, our parameter were not 1 half, we should probably, we should probably reason this way. So you've got 10 choose 5 plus 10 choose 6. I guess we switched to green. Uh, 1 half to the power of 10. And that means what we need to compute now is 10 choose 5 and 10 choose 6. We already know that 1 half to the power of the 10 is uh, uh, 1 over 1,024. So 10 choose 5, that's going to be uh, 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 divided by 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And 10 choose 6 is equal to 210. And that's because 10 choose 6 is equal to 10 choose 4. I'm going to leave it up to you to figure that out. I believe that was a problem in the exercise set. But, yeah, that's a thing. So, now what we need to figure out is 10 choose 5. So, we've got the 5 and the 2 canceling out with the 10. The 3 canceling out with the 9, reducing it to 3. Uh, and the 4 canceling out with the 8, reducing it to 2. So, we've got in the numerator... 3 times 2 times 7 times 6, and 3 times 2 times 7 times 6 is uh, 252, I believe. Yeah, so it's going to be, yeah, that's 252. So this quantity evaluates to 252. So we will get for the R probability. Uh, 252 plus 210, which is, uh, which is going to be 462 divided by 1,024, which that is, that's around point, uh, five after you do some rounding. Uh, we could also do some reducing of that fraction too. Now that said, there was an alternative way we could have computed this quantity, which was to say that this is equal to the CDF at 6 minus the CDF at 4. And then what's left to, what's left to do is get the CDF at 6 and 4. All right, well, let's get that. I'm gonna have to boot up an R session. All right, so we've got P binom. That's the function that is responsible for working with binomial random variables. And we're going to give P binom, what are we going to give it? Uh, right, so we're going to give it Six, our other parameters are size, that's 10, and prob is equal to 0 0.5 minus p binom, which is going at four, size equals 10, prob equals 0 0.5. Yeah, about 0 0.45, which rounds to about 0 0.5, which for what it's worth, 
I said it was approximately 0.5 when we were doing stuff by hand. And that was because we were rounding. <laughs> I knew I was rounding when I was uh, when I was when I was saying that's about 0.5. So, uh, well, let's go ahead and write down that more exact exact answer. Say that this is approximately 0.45. Okay. Next example, compute the probability that two is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to four. We could do this by summing up over the probability mass function, but now I really don't want to do that. I'm just, I mean, I've got better ways to spend my time. So I'm going to instead say that this is equal to the CDF at four, minus the CDF at uh, two minus one. Remember we have to do the two minus one because we need to include the two in our region. And the only way to do that is if we do two minus one. Okay, and uh, the other parameters are 10 and one half. And I mean, you guys know what two one, minus one is, this is equal to one, which is going to be, well, Uh, let's compute this. So P binom at one minus P binom or other way around actually. So we got four. All right, so 0 0.366. So approximately equal to 0 0.366. What is the probability that you see more than seven heads? Strictly more. So this is the probability that X is greater than seven. That is, well, the converse event or the, uh, um, the complementary event to X being greater than seven is X is less than or equal to seven. So this is going to be one minus the probability that x is less than or equal to seven. Since remember the probability of a complement is one minus the probability of a, the complement of the set x is greater than seven is x is less than or equal to seven. So then we get that formula. Uh, so this is going to be, uh, oops. This is equal to one minus the CDF at seven with parameters 10 and 1 half. And now we need to compute that and we're going to turn to R for that. So this is one minus the CDF at seven size equals 10 prob equals 0 0.5. So the probability is about 0 0.05, let's say 0 0.055. So this is approximately equal to 0 0.055. Now I should probably mention something else about how the software is working. We could have done instead P binom uh, seven size equals 10 prob equals 0 0.5. And there's an additional parameter that all of these uh, P functions have, which is lower dot tail. Lower dot tail, let's set that equal to false. That got us the same thing. Uh, the P, so basically these P binom functions, by default they're giving you the CDF, but they can also give you one minus the CDF if you set lower tail equals false. If you were to ask the developers for these functions, they would say that rather than doing one minus the, uh, the CDF or one minus P binom or whatever, you should use the lower tail equals false parameter. The reason being that you're going to get less numerical error if you're using the lower tail equals false parameter. Because numerical error is very much a thing. Like we care, whenever whenever we're using software to compute numbers, we care about numerical error. And it turns out that setting lower tail, tail equals false 
that results in less numerical error. Uh, I, I don't really know why. I'm guessing it's because they can do some more optimizations or some other fancy uh, numerical tricks. Thing is, as an instructor, I like to make sure that people are thinking, like, this expression or this relationship, like, I really want students to understand that. And it's very easy to just lose that under the easiness of this, of this, um, of this, uh, of this function and this notation. So I don't know how frequently I'm going to do that. Um, and also for, for whatever it's worth, sometimes when I'm write, writing my own uh, functions for probability, uh, I don't always include that parameter myself just because I can't, I don't have it. I don't, I don't really know what the developers are doing to make sure that lower tail equals false gets you more accurate answers. Uh, so also, by the way, if, if it, you're watching this in the future, hello, future person. If you're watching this in the future and you're using a table because maybe because I told you to, uh, you're using a table for these calculations. You don't have access to the probability that X is greater than seven. You only have access to the probability that X is less than or equal to seven. So being aware of um, how this stuff is working uh, or at least being aware of this uh, relationship that I've underlined in blue still matters a great deal. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, continuing on, compute the expected value of X, the variance of X, and the standard deviation of X. All right. So the expected value of X. Uh, let's see. All right. The expected value of x is n times p, which is 10 times 1 half, which is equal to 5. All right, simple enough. Uh, the variance of x is n times p times 1 minus p, which is 5 times 1 half which is five halves or 2.5. The standard deviation of X is going to be the square root of five halves. And I don't know what that is off the top of my head. So we can just leave it like that. That's fine. All right, uh, our functions that are doing this stuff. Well, I think we just did it. So some of this is completely redundant. Um, here I actually created a random variable using discrete RV, which presumably is loaded up. Uh, so I create a random variable X to represent the X that we were talking about before and compute its expected value, variance, and standard deviation. These are basically the same as what I had before. I also plotted its probability mass function. This is what its probability mass function looks like. Okay, next example. You're you, a manufacturer of widgets sends batches of widgets and giant bins. Your company will accept a shipment of, widget, of widgets if no more than 7% of widgets are defective. The procedure for deciding whether a shipment is defective is to choose four widgets from the batch at random without replacement. If more than one widget is defective, the batch is rejected. What's the probability of rejecting the batch if 7% of widgets are defective? Model the process using a binomial random variable. So we have so we're going to assume that there are, in fact, 7% of widgets. And actually, the argument being used in this problem, uh, this problem is kind of suggesting the possibility. Well, actually, the procedure being described in this problem is basically a hypothesis test. And uh, we're going to talk more about hypothesis testing later in a later chapter. Uh, but basically what you do when you're working on the mathematics of a hypothesis test for computing p-values and all that stuff, you assume that the null hypothesis is true. So the null hypothesis is that 7% of the widgets are defective. So um, uh, so in this case, we assume that 7% of widgets are defective, in which case the distribution of the random variable uh, x is going to be, well, let's see, how many widgets did they pull out? Four. Uh, so n is equal to 4, and p is equal to 0 
Okay. So, also there's another wrinkle here. The bin of widgets has a finite number of bins. Uh, no, 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 not a not finite number of bins. It has a finite number of widgets. But this binomial random variable is not supposed to work in that situation. See, if there's a finite number of successes in this uh, possible in this finite population, then an implication of that is that you don't have independent successes and failures. Because if you pull a success out of the population, you cannot pull that success again. And presumably in this example, when a when this uh, uh, when, when you're checking the widgets, uh, you pull out a widget, you check it, but you don't put it back in the bin for you to draw again. No one ever does that. So actually we don't have independent Bernoulli trials. So we don't have uh, a sum of independent Bernoullis. We don't have independent trials, which means that technically this random variable should not be a binomial random variable. Actually, the random variable that is more accurate for this context is what's known as a hypergeometric random variable, which we'll talk about in a later section. Thing though is, if the sample, if the population is large enough relative to how many successes there are in the sample, like if there's a million widgets and 7% of those widgets are defective, then that means that about 70,000 defective widgets exist in the sample or in the population, my, my, my apologies. Uh, in which case, it, the, the numbers are so large that basically you can treat this as a binomial experiment anyway. Because the difference between the binomial random variable and this more accurate random variable, the hypergeometric random variable, those differences are negligible. So you so you you get to you get to cheat. You get to use the simpler binomial random variable as opposed to the more complicated more complicated hypergeometric. Okay. So let's carry on then. They want to know what is the probability of rejecting the batch if 7% are defective? Uh, if more than one widget is defective. Okay, with this problem, we actually need to translate out because this is a word problem. And by the way, in stats classes, I absolutely love to ask word problems. So many word problems. Because statistics is so applied that it just feels inappropriate to not be asking word problems. Um, it's, it's such an applied subject that you have to be asking them. Okay. So what corresponds to rejecting the batch? You reject the, the batch if there's more than one defective widget in your sample. So that's so more than one, that means greater than one. And our random variable for tracking the number of defective widgets that we found is X. And I guess, all right, a student might find it, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're calling a defective widget a success? Yes, it's mostly for the language. All right, so. This is the probability we want to compute. We want to compute the probability that x is greater than 1, which is equal to 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 1. And at this point, you could say, all right, let's go to r and compute this. And I'm going to say, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to instead compute this thing by hand uh, and say that this is going to be the PMF at uh, 0, or parameters 4 and 0.07 plus the probability mass function at one. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I need to say that this is equal to one minus parentheses, all that stuff. <laughs> okay. All right, there we go. That's correct. And now we need to compute each of those probability mass functions. Okay, so. The probability mass function at zero is going to be, uh, we've got four choose zero and four choose zero is one. There's only one way to choose uh, none of the four things 
in your in your little group, and that's to choose all the one all the other ones. There's only one way to do it. So four two zero is one. Uh, next up, we've got uh, what do, what have we got? Um, oh yeah, uh, so point oh seven to the zeroth power, and point nine three to the fourth power. B one for point oh seven is equal to four choose one, which hopefully you know is four. You can at least reason about it. It's like, okay, how many ways are there to pick one thing out of four? We'll pick one of those four things. All right, there we go. Um, <laughs> uh, so there we go. Uh, so then we got 0.07 to the first power, 0.93 to the third power. Uh, and after this, you go to a calculator com to compute those numbers. I think I actually computed them rather accurately in my notes. So let's see, what did I have? Okay, so what I'm seeing here is that this is equal to, so the, so the top one is equal to 0.748052. That is an exact number. I got a little carried away with the accuracy. <laughs> and the second one is 0.22522. And that means that we're going to have that this quantity here that ultimately is what we're trying to compute uh, is equal to 1 minus uh, 0 0.748052 plus 0 0.22522, which is equal to 1 minus 0.973272. Three two seven two, which is equal to point oh two six seven two eight. All right. Uh, next up, oh yeah, there it is. Excuse me. My apologies. I had to sneeze. <laughs> Okay, uh, next example. Uh, this one's fun. I claim that I can make 80% of my free throw shots when playing basketball. You plan to test me by having me shoot 20 baskets. If I make fewer baskets than a specified amount, you will call me a liar. The threshold amount of baskets is chosen so that the probability I make less than this amount, given that I am, in fact, an 80% free throw shooter, does not exceed 5%. What is the threshold amount? All right. Uh, oh, yeah. Additionally, compute the mean and standard deviation of the number of shots I would make if my claim is true. Okay. Uh, let's do this. Let's do the second part first because that's easier. Uh, the first part is going to require a conversation. So the expected value will say um, S is following a binomial distribution uh, with uh, parameters. I'm going to shoot 20 baskets. Yeah. So N is 20 and P is 0.8. Because, all right, this is again a hypothesis testing type problem, in which case you're assuming that I am, in fact, an 80% free throw shooter. So the expected value of not x, because I decided not to do x, um, is, of s is going to be 0.8 times 20, which is equal to 16. So you expect me to make 16% of my baskets. Uh, the did I ask for standard deviation? Yes, I did. So the the variance of this random variable is going to be uh, twenty times point eight times point two, which is equal to three point two, and the standard deviation of s is equal to the square root of 3.2 which i don't know off the top of my head and i i'm i'm just i'm just not gonna bother okay all right so that was the easy part now for the hard part 
I have asked that you pick a threshold amount of baskets so that the probability I make less than this amount, given that I am in fact an 80% free throw shooter, does not exceed 5%. All right, so we will call this threshold amount, we will give it a name. Uh, the threshold amount, we will call this, we will call this quantity K. All right, I'm asking that, I, I'm asking you to find a K such that the probability that S is, let's see, so if I make fewer baskets, so S is less than K, this number needs to be at most 5%. So this needs to be at least 0.05. Well, at most 0.05. Uh, and uh, actually there's gonna be a number of uh, possible Ks such that it's less than 0.05, but we're going to say that this is the largest possible K, uh, such, that th such that this probability is less than or equal to 0.05. Uh, K is a constant here. We just don't know what it is. Uh, S is a random variable. Uh, let's go ahead and play around with this expression some more uh, before continuing on. This is saying that the probability that S is less than or equal to K minus 1 uh, less than or equal to k minus 1. That's going to be less than or equal to 0.05. All right, so we actually, so by doing that, I have the CDF on the left-hand side of the inequality and 0.05 on the right-hand side. So we're go what we need to do now is basically a reverse lookup. We're looking up a number such that the CDF is um, less than or equal to 0.05. The largest number possible such that the CDF is less than or equal to 0.05. This is similar to the notion of quantile uh, because a qu so you have a probability that a random variable is less than or equal to uh, let's say 10%, then the 10th quantile is that number. Uh, so this is actually related to the notion of quantiles. The unfortunate thing, though, is that what we're talking about are discrete random variables, which has this complication in that it's possible that the CDF, in fact, not just possible, it's quite likely that the CDF never actually equals 0.05. If it were, in fact, equal for the CDF to equal 0.05, then we would say, all right, pick a K minus 1 such that the CDF is equal to 0.05. The only thing, though, is that's not actually likely to be the case. Um, it's likely that the CDF never actually reaches 0.05. In fact, let's now go to R. So let's look at, so we got uh, the CDF. The CDF is, so possible values for this random variable are from 0 to 20. So we're going to ask for the CDF's values from for all numbers between 0 and 20. Size is equal to 20. Prob is equal to 0.8. Oh, that's, that's not very helpful. Um, <laughs> all right. I think that if we were looking at the, the uh, textbook, we would be rounding to uh, three decimal places. So, uh, so digits equals... Three. All right, yeah, this is, yeah, we're going to do this just because, like, what we have up here is scientific notation, which may be more accurate, but uh, also it's hard to read. So we're going to round to three decimal places and, and work with this. So this is the CDF. Uh, and what we're looking for is, uh, we would go, let's actually, let's actually call it, give this vector a name. So we'll call it CDF and we'll say names CDF will be 0 to 20. So now let's print out CDF. Okay. All right. So, 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 so. Um, what we're looking for in this is a, is a quantity where the CDF uh, 
does uh, so that so like notice that the CDF is increasing as we increase the input to the CDF, right? Our CDF is increasing, but and we want to find the largest number that we can put into the CDF such that it doesn't exceed 0.05, and that number is 12, because at 12 the CDF is going to be 0.032, and at 13 the CDF is going to be 0.087. So it crosses that threshold at 12, suggesting the that k minus one, uh, suggesting that k minus one equals 12. And then we add one to both sides to suggest that k is equal to 13. That is, if I score less than, if I make less than 13 baskets, you're gonna call me a liar. Uh, what is uh, 13 divided by 20? That is uh, 0.6, so that's 0.65. So if I make 65% uh, or less than, if I make less than 65% of my baskets, you're gonna call me a liar. The principle being, uh, the, the logic being that that is such a rare amount, it's so unlikely for you to score less than 60%, 65% of your baskets if you were, in fact, an 80% free throw, free throw shooter, that we're actually going to say it's more likely that you're lying than you're actually telling the truth. Or at least it seems it seems unreasonable to continue to believe that you are still telling the truth. So this is... This, so so that's how you would use like the CDF if we were if we if you were using the textbook you would use the CDF this way you would scan the CDF uh, for some reason my mouse stopped working I don't know why this is a super cheap computer you would scan the CDF until eventually you crossed over that 0.05 threshold and then take whatever this uh, what take whatever number got the CDF to uh, just below that threshold. So if I had switched this to uh, say, all right, it needs to be less than or equal to 0.10, then we would go to 13. We haven't crossed 0.10 yet. We would go to 14, but then we then we would cross. So we would say, all right, the threshold amount is 13. Uh, let's say that I said instead 0.01. Uh, actually, 11 is probably not what you would choose because you know that we're rounding here. So you would go with 10. So... Because you know that actually, well, I don't know what what was a uh, eleven. So if we look back at the original vector, that's a bit more accurate. That doesn't have any rounding. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Uh, the next one. Oh, actually, it's rounding up, so you could choose 11. Yeah, 11 would be fine. So, yeah, it it, it doesn't always round down. <laughs> uh, so that's what you would do. You would just kind of reverse look from the uh, the uh, from the CDF, especially if you're using the book. Or you could use QBinom. Uh, we'll put in 0 0.05. Size equals 20. Prob equals 0.8. You could have used... Uh, uh, okay, what exactly is QBinom doing? Uh, it might be doing something else. It might be saying, okay, you exceed it. Because... So we actually might need to do QBinom minus 1. Uh, let's look at the documentation for QBinom. Oh. I think you just... Yeah, you, you would just have to recognize... Alright, so... Uh, it's going to give you some details somewhere. Okay, so it says right here, the quantile is defined as the smallest value x such that f of x is greater than or equal to p, which is actually different from how I just defined it. So R's definition of what a quantile is for discrete random variables is uh, different than what I just said. So being aware of that, you would actually have to take uh, whatever Q binom gave you and then do minus 1. To get the right answer okay but all right or i mean i i don't know <laughs> like there's so many different ways to possibly think about it and say okay the q binom that it, that r actually has is uh effectively uh giving you this quantity right away so you don't have to work with the cdf 
You, that's another way you could possibly think about it. All right. So, uh, by the way, what we're basically saying is that if you ended up shooting a number of baskets such that you ended up in uh, 11, 12, such that you ended up in this region, it's so unlikely if you were, in fact, an 80% free throw shooter to end up in this region, I'm justified in saying you're a liar. How unlikely is it? Well, it's actually 3.2%. Uh, uh, it's so 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 unlikely that we would just call you a liar because if you were in fact a free throw shooter, you should probably be ending up in the other region. An 80% free throw shooter, my, my apologies. I'm always confusing my words. Okay, so that's it for uh, the binomial random variable. And in the next section, we will be talking about the hypergeometric and negative binomial distributions. All right, so I will see you there.